Michael Smith is not here, but our brother, his and mine, Charles Robinson is. You gotta say, Charles, when I say you're our brother, you're, you are our brother, and I don't and I don't say anything else, it's like if you, you, you meet some people and they say, hey, this is my brother, this is my sister, and they're looking for you to fill in some gaps, and you don't. <laughs> Yeah, he's our brother. Same mama, same daddy. What? What? You got questions? You got questions? What's up? Yeah, we family. Don't ask, don't ask how it makes sense. It makes There's sense. No gaps. This is my no brother. No gaps that need to Not be what? filled in. No gaps. There's no That's gaps right. that need to be filled in, right? We're good. You wanna you wanna fight over this? You wanna talk about it? I ain't answering no, none of your questions. Do you have any type of a timetable as to what you might want to do uh, regarding your football career? Jim, if I knew what I was gonna fucking do, I'd have already fucking done it. Okay, I'm taking it a day at a time. I sense you're antagonized by the question. <laughs> he was talking to Michael Holly, the Slim Reaper talk. That was for you, okay? That wasn't meant for like like people. People right now are like Tom Brady, your slip is showing. No, he was like uh, Michael Holly. I got a little message. I'm gonna send it through Jim Gray. Jim Gray <laughs> took a stray. That's what we're gonna talk. Yeah, That's what we're gonna <laughs> He did it for us. Have other HBCUs reached out to y'all? We've been in contact with other H, uh, head coaches from HBCUs. I turned down the Jackson State job to come here, Roland Martin. Jackson, Jackson. State called, Prime called me. Deion Sanders called me himself, man. Gave me. So, so every, listen, everything is that Ed is saying is, is accurate. There have been other offers before. Bethune Cookman in previous years from other Grambling. from uh, from bro. From, oh, man, I'm sorry, bro. From from other HBCUs, there there's been opportunities for Ed to be a head coach at at multiple colleges. This was a, a, an opportunity. The location, the campus, everything about Bethune Cookman was extremely appealing, which led him to ultimately choosing this over the opportunity at other institutions. You know, it, it just hit me, y'all. All of us are Ed Reed, or Ed Reed is all of us. Everybody been gets collectively like this with this whole Ed Reed Bethune Cookman situation. We all are just holding our, our face in our hands right now. We're all face palming. We had to get the group chat going for this one. What a week it's been uh, when it comes to Bethune Cookman University. We got Dr. Jason Johnson, we got Karn Phillips, and we got Don Montgomery. Um, start with you, Jason. Professor, what have we learned? Through this entire ordeal. If there were a living meme of the guy with like 12 cigarettes in his hands with his face just like this, like that's that's how I feel. That's how I feel watching this. What we have seen, the biggest takeaway in the last week, which is what I said last week on the show, Bethune Cookman had every right and reason to fire Ed Reed. He demonstrated without any question on the air with Roland Martin, and I watched it live, that he lacks the temperament, the discipline, the focus, and the communication skills to be the most prominent face on that campus. A separate issue, which we will get into, is that Bethune-Cookman is a mess. That was never in doubt, but the conversation was not about whether or not Bethune-Cookman was an organized university or institution, it was whether or not Ed Reed's behavior warranted being fired. And I think that between the IG Live, the weird statements that he made after his contract was canceled, and the interview with Roland Martin, it is abundantly clear that they made the right decision. Whether or not we can keep this conversation focused on Bethune-Cookman as opposed to slamming all HBCUs, which is what Ed Reed did, that'll be the important thing moving forward. And we're definitely coming back to that. Karen, if Bethune-Cookman University had listened to you, uh, they'd have never hired uh, Ed Reed in the first place because right here on this here program, Jason referenced how he took us to church last week. Right here on this here program, you told us what time it was with Deion Sanders at Jackson State from the beginning. So I'll ask you the same thing I asked Jason. <laughs> what have we learned uh, from this entire ordeal this past week, this week or so? Um, it's bigger than this past last week. It's been about the last two, three years since Deion Sanders took this job. Um, took the job at Jackson State. What we have learned is that, and, and, I, and I wrote that in my, in my desk band column um, for this morning, too many black and white people 
who have no idea how HBCUs work, our culture, our history, what we go through, why the things we don't have, it's probably because some some state board or somewhere, no matter if the HBCU is public or private, hasn't given us the money that we've owned, if we've been in these holes trying to climb out. All of a sudden, just because your cousin, your daddy went to some HBCU or you went to a couple homecomings or- Or you because, watched a different world. Oh, you watched a different world, you <laughs> use lotion, and because you're black and like hot sauce, you now know. What the black folks should be doing at they black schools. Now, mind you, most of these black folks think these black schools are beneath um, these white schools that they attend. But you want to show up in 2020 when this racial rec or, or, or reckoning is supposed to happen takes place over in, hey, I want to go to Howard Homecoming. I want to go to A&T Homecoming. I want to go to Spellhouse Homecoming. Then you rock with us. But when it's time to listen to us and shut up and be quiet and set out of situations, because you get tired of the microaggressions you've done at these PWIs and you realize that you should have brought your ass home like the smart ones did. Now you've got all these situations and you're sitting up here in these DEI meetings at your job and you're like, well, this is what we should do to donate to these HBCUs when you don't know nothing. And then this conversation happened and it was like, yeah, let's hire the football, a uh, great football player who don't know nothing about coaching or running the program and let him put a, sh a spotlight on these programs. These, these programs wouldn't have spotlight. You just weren't paying attention. You just didn't care. But when it's right. something sexy like Prime or Ed Reed show up, now you all of a sudden are some historian on how these campuses and universities work when you haven't even grasped the idea to talk to somebody who has HBCU credit. Don't nobody give a damn about athletes on HBCU campuses or those sports. They are always at the bottom of the social climate and ladder. So if you expect us now to pour all this money in thoughts and prayers and cares into athletics and football, that ain't why we was created. That ain't why we've thrived and survived. Football is cool, sports are great. Do we need to get better at them? Yes, but that ain't why you come here. If you want to go and be a cheerleader and you want your team to be in the CFP, go Power Five, go to the SEC, go to the Big Ten. If you want to be a better person and a better human being, come on home. I had a feeling y'all would take us to church today. Uh, <laughs> Dawn, you were getting you were getting a word a second ago. You were passing the collection plate. You passed on some some facts on your Twitter account because I mean, when I saw the Roland Martin interview and props to Roland for the work he's done covering this story. When I saw the the Roland Martin. Uh, clip of, um, of 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 Ed saying I turned down Jackson State Prime called me. I'm like, damn, I didn't know Dion was hiring on the way out. I didn't know he had it like that. At least that's the way <laughs> it, it, it came off. Stop. But you clarified <laughs> what actually went down at Jackson State. And mm -hmm. beyond that, what have we learned, Dawn? If, I mean, overall, like a hit dog is going to holler. We'll start there. Um, everybody knows that. Um, and I feel like when he had to come out and be defensive and say, I turned down the Jackson State job, I, you know, he wants someone to feel him. He wants someone to understand that he's hurt. But um, he has to check his ego first and foremost, because although Dion might have called him to kind of follow up with him, because yes, the AD, um, Ashley Robinson at Jackson State, as well as the president, Dr. Thomas Hudson at Jackson State, were both talking about considering him for the head coaching position there. Just because you go to a school or you get a phone call or you visit, even have maybe one or two interviews, that does not mean that you've actually gotten the job. That does not mean that they have actually offered you something. Um, and I just, in the midst of all of this, one of the things that I just feel like we should all be mindful of there's a current coach there now who is stepping in to those shoes that are going to be pretty big to feel, but at the same time, he doesn't want the limelight. He doesn't want cameras everywhere to show with that he can do the job that he's doing. And I want to shout out T.C. Taylor because he is doing his job. He's been recruiting. He's been working with the team. The team knows him, and he's ready for this shift. But for someone like Ed Reed to be acting out like this, this is the main reason why BCU could not have hired him because they weren't ready for that type of visibility they, they weren't ready for the those these types of conversations that are being had now as you know we've all stated both things can be true bcu 
I necessarily did not even have the foundation to even utter the words that they were going to try to bring someone like that um, onto campus to try to create more visibility around the athletic department. So I just think that it's a, it's a difficult thing to kind of see this man act out publicly the way that he's been doing. But I think what we've kind of seen from other coaches um, here and there, uh, I think we're, it's, it's kind of up to par to how he feels that he's been mistreated and things like that overall. And, and, and to quickly add something that Don just said, by Ari saying that, he either dry snitched or somebody's lying. Because I vividly remember right. since Coach Prime loves to put everything on film and post it on social media, he sat in a team meeting after he announced that he was leaving and said, I know who I want to be our next coach in his TC. So he if sure you wanted Thank him you. to be the coach, then how yes, did you did. also call Ed Reed? So either yeah. Ed Reed dry snitched on his boy or Dion lied in front of his team about his support for TC. And yeah. if you would have listened to me, you never would have hired <laughs> either of these clowns and we wouldn't have to deal with it. But, let, but so we just, we just saw I, the video. I got I want to ask also of, this, Michael. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I it. just, because I think part of what, what, what everybody else is pointing out here is that we've got, we've got two separate conversations going on by Ed Reed and I think a lot of it sometimes is confusing. Then, you know, we're, we're clarifying, we're only clarifying. You can have a conversation about what's happening in HBCU athletics, and you can have a conversation about the celebrity former NFL guys coming in and playing, and one doesn't necessarily have to bleed into the other the same way. And what we're seeing here is a lot of times it's being conflated, and the people who are suffering happen to be a bunch of kids down on a campus that's had financial problems for 15 to 20 years now, and they're not necessarily being heard the way they need to be heard because their educational problems go much deeper than anything Ed Reed was going to be able to fix. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, we, the protests about the conditions, uh, the mold, the mildew, right. what have you, um, the infrastructural issues, uh, or about just the athletic issues, um, or even the protests, uh, you know, against the board of trustees wanting Ed Reed to be reinstated, yada, yada, yada. There's, there are, there are issues at Bethune-Cookman University, just like there are issues at all institutions, at many HBCUs, at PWIs. There are issues worth protesting, there are issues worth fighting for. So, talk about two things can be true at the same time. Um, Ed Reed could not be fit to coach. The university could determine that he's not fit to coach and there still could be issues that the university needs to address. But the thing that rubbed me the wrong way during uh, that FaceTime uh, that he had with Dion when he was uh, broadcasting his goodbye to the team is Dion saying, hey, you know, you already know what it is. Sometimes you got to walk away. I know what you're going through. It's like, is are we all in it? we all family? We all connected? Yes. HBCUs are obviously connected, right? They may share a similar mission, a, a shared experience. But what 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 went down with Dion has nothing, nothing. to do with what <laughs> went down with Ed Reed at Bethune Cookman University. And what bothers me about it is only with black people is something a reflection or a referendum on all of us. It's like so 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 why is this an opportunity? for, you know, it's the conversation to go to a place where it's like, oh, all, all H this is what's wrong with all HBCUs. It's like they might as well just say, well, this is the problem with all black people. Or this mm -hmm. is why we can't mm -hmm. have nothing. It's like, no, 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 no. This is specific mm -hmm. to Ed Reed and Bethune-Cookman University, not some kind of re negative reflection or, or stereotype that's being perpetuated about HBCUs at large, Karn. Like, Mike, what you saw in that IG Live when he jumped in was a quitter and someone who pimped Jackson State in HBCU yes. culture tell Ed Reed, hey, go ahead and quit too like I did, dog." And what's funny about that is that the quitter <laughs> told Ed Reed to quit when Ed Reed hadn't even filled out a W-2 yet. Like, that dude didn't even have his, his uh, direct deposit information on file in the school. That's how quick <laughs> they got him up out of there. And so that was the thing when I found out when scrolling Twitter, and saw that Dion had jumped into that life. I already knew what he was going to say. 
um because i saw it i think he was on the view um giving advice to what uh because they were talking about the subject right. to what Ed Reed should do and i'm like look unless he is telling you how to be the greatest cornerback of all time how to be a two-time uh two-sport athlete or how to return punts or kicks do not listen to Deion sanders advice <laughs> about anything Dawn, what was that about <laughs> from your perspective? From my perspective, that was a, a, a moment for two men who have this ego and have this thought of who they are and how the world should work for them. And they were trauma bonding, you know what I'm saying? In a sense where it's like, well, you know, I went through that too. So um, I, I can tell you a little bit about that. But here's the thing with Dion that I think people are getting tired of seeing on my timeline is that number one, too, I'm not gonna say his name too many more too many more times because the man has decided where he's gonna go and I need him to move on. Number two, what is it so bad about Jackson State and the way that Jackson State opened up their campus, their doors, their facilities, all of the things, and whether he contributed towards that to make things better? Yes, he did. We've we've never discounted anything that he had brought to the table over at Jackson State, but Jackson State foundationally was more prepared to welcome in someone with that big of an ego and that big of a uh, presence and say, hey, you don't have this coaching resume. We see that you want to, to step into this and get to the next level. We want to give you the space to do that because uh, again, I've talked about this at nauseum on my timeline, our HBCU show up as spaces for us to grow, for us to learn, for us to be better as people, for us to come together as a community and to be safe. And right now, the narratives that they are pushing aren't safe because here it is, you've got more black men and or black student athletes who are agreeing with some of these things and nobody's talking about solutions. If you have all this money, then why don't you fix right. it? But you can't because it's a systemic racism situation. So we have it's, it's, it's even bigger than what their egos tend to be whenever they show up on our timelines and they just want somebody to agree with them in the moment and they don't realize the damage that they're causing in the midst of all of this. If it's really about the student athletes, if it's really about the students, then push the limelight more on them rather than how you feel as a grown man, knowing that you got bills to pay and you may not have a job tomorrow because you're running your mouth. Jason? I'm gonna say this, and it's a great quote from Michael <laughs> and Jay-Z. Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. All this really kind of goes back to money and some numbers that I think get missed in this context, which is one of the reasons I was so critical of Ed Reed. Number one, when people are talking about HBCUs, can we remind the audience there's 106 HBCUs in America, mm -hmm. 106. Mm -hmm. Most people can only name 12. So you can't make general statements it's about heavy. HBCUs, Ed Reed or Deion Sanders, when you have 106 institutions. That's the first thing. Not all of them even have athletics departments. So that's the other issue. But here's something else to put this into context. The New York City Police Department, New York City Police Department, I looked this up. The one year annual budget for the New York City Police Department is more than the endowment of all 106 HBCUs combined. The budget for one year of the New York City Police Department is $10 billion. That's more than 106 of our institutions. So when you talk about what we can and cannot do, you've got to look at what has been systematic denial of adequate resources to state and private institutions for a century. I am here in Maryland, in the state of Maryland, which is a blue state. After a 15 year lawsuit, the state of Maryland has agreed to pay $577 million to the HBCUs in the state because of systematic denial of funding. That took 15 years. And that's Maryland, a blue state. So what do you think is happening to black schools in Alabama and Texas and Florida and Jackson? And when private schools and public schools are denied in this way, this is where you get these problems. This was the conversation that Dion doesn't want to have and that Ed doesn't want to have. They want to come in and attack these schools and scream and yell and say it's a general problem and not discuss the roots of the issues. And let me also say this, because this is what everybody wants to respond with. Well, you know what? We need to give more to our schools, blah, blah, blah. I promise you, if every single graduate 
graduate of Bethune Cookman College from 1980 to the present gave $1,000 a year is still a drop in the bucket from what they would get from the kind of funding that you can get from state or private resources, which our schools are systematically denied. And you know what makes this uh, even worse uh, is that probably the four of us will be having the same conversation in a couple months um, because a little breaking news today. Uh, Y'all remember that story about Marcus Stokes, uh, the QB, the recruit who lost his scholarship at Florida uh, for saying the N-word? Well, he just got an offer from Albany State. So uh, <laughs> here we go again. Uh, here we go. Yep. Albany, Albany State. <laughs> no, no, Bakari, you, uh, you, wrap, you wrap up your column today with, there's no point in putting a spotlight on something if you're not going to be around long enough to see it through. Um, where does where does Bethune Cookman in particular, given the issues that were present before Ed Reed got there, clearly, where does right. Bethune Cookman University in particular, but also this spotlight? Where does it where does where does it go? Uh, I hate to say the conversation because to your point, some of us are jumping in and out of this conversation conveniently, whereas for many people, this conversation is ongoing. Okay, I'm, I'm talking to a professor at Morgan right. State University. So, where, do, where does it go from here, Karen? I'll, and I'll go all, to all of you guys with that. Where does it go from here? Uh, it's going to go the same way it always go. Um, if you paid attention to HBCUs and how we're viewed upon um, by America as a whole, and that that's all races and colors. Um, we have these ebbs and flows. Remember the '90s and all the gear. Um, that you saw in 90s black television shows and everybody repping stuff and wearing schools, the height of Freaknik and a different world we were talking about uh, school, uh, off the back of school days and all of these things. And then, you know, we had the spotlight then. Then it goes away a little bit. Then something happens right. in corporate America. Remember that, that we're here and it's like, oh, they have these really good bands and they dance. Oh, my God. And they step. What is this? <laughs> um, and then these moments happen, right? And it's like, but every time a moment happens, everybody forget that there were moments in the past that happened. <coughs> oh, yes. And another decade or so, uh, we'll have another one of these moments. And that's what's so frustrating is that a lot of the work, a lot of the attention, and a lot of the progress and improvement happens when the spotlight isn't on. And that's what I wrote about. It was like, that's what's so frustrating about Ed Reed and Deion Sanders was if they just would have stayed for what one recruiting class or been there for five, six, seven years and actually built a program, you could have seen that spotlight last a little longer and seen the progress in the good things that do come from these moments. But it's when things happen at, at the flick of a switch, you don't see the work that gets done in the dark. And that's the thing that angers me about this. And I always feels like the Ed Reese and the Deion Sanders know that. So they hop in when the spotlight is on to get in and, and you know, put you know, you know, help themselves. And then when they know that light is getting ready to get snatched out the socket, that's when they dip and slide out. Right. Dawn, what's your final thought? So my final thoughts kind of go towards um, acknowledging one of the other HBCUs that has not been in the conversation because they don't necessarily have athletics and that's Morris Brown College and what Dr. Kevin James has been doing over there and the hard reset and rebuilding and getting the accreditation back and things like that. But one of the things that he just more recently did was that Senator John Ossoff from the state of Georgia was able to secure funding for Morris Brown. Right. One second. So. Tell somebody Sorry about that, a, tell that person you're a very important tell them you're having a very important okay. conversation. <laughs> Okay. So Senator John Ossoff was able <laughs> was able to um, secure funding for Morris Brown, and and that's where the next conversation needs to go. In this is knowing that you have senators, you have state representatives, you have city council people, you have people, you have politicians that have 
to step in and understand how important it is for these students to have better housing, better accommodations, just overall a better experience at these HBCUs. If you're going to hold back the money, where's the money that we really do need in order to change things so that these narratives can kind of die down? Um, I feel like we're going to consistently hear somebody come back and forth and say, well, at least the Ed Reed was right. At least some of the things that Dion had to share was correct. But in the midst of that, where are the actual solutions? And uh, one of the parts of the solutions is really kind of finding the people that can find the funding and make the things happen that we need to make happen at these HBCUs. And quickly before Dr. Jason Dick. goes, oh. Morris Brown lost their accreditation my freshman year at Morehouse. That was 2003. Right. Look how mm -hmm. long it's mm -hmm. taken for them to get Come back. On. Like, I, I was there for that last year at MoB before things uh, crumbled. So, shout out to them for coming back and the AUC being hold again. Sorry, Jason, go ahead. Mm -hmm. we, no, that's okay. We got dogs barking. I just want to say this quick. A last word with Dr. Jason Johnson. Uh, take us home. <laughs> I just want to say this. We need to stop looking for saviors for our institutions and we need to stop giving people space to claim their saviors. Okay, I look, I have about as much faith in Ed Reed or Deion Sanders to build and recreate and organize a school as I do Umar Johnson. Okay, like it, no, none of these people have the skill set. Okay, these institutions have lots of issues in some cases that have to do with athletics. In some instances, they don't have any problems with athletics. We have to look at these individuals as men and women taking jobs and then cover them as people taking jobs. Ed Reed is not there to be the daddy of these students. Ed Reed was not there to be the savior. He allowed himself to present that way. Some people gave him credit for that, but it is a job. That would have meant following the students, keeping up with their grades, kicking some of those guys out of the program. This is real work. And I think all too often what we miss, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation because we're hitting on it, is that these are institutions worthy of respect, worthy of discipline and worthy of professionalism. And if you're not capable of doing that, if the first time you receive any sort of brushback, you're crying like boys to men at the Grammys, then you ain't up for the job. And I'm sure there are dozens of men and women across the country who will be willing to go into these institutions and fight the good fight long term, not just for the students, but also for the student athletes. And those are the people that I hope we're focusing on in the future. And these celebrity folks stop stunt casting themselves into positions that they were never committed to to begin with. Not a better way to end it than that. Jason, Dawn, Karn, we appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for the conversation. Uh, let's definitely keep it going. Appreciate all you guys have written, said, and tweeted about these issues, uh, both in the dark and in the light, um, as you said, Karn. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> Thank you. And what happened to Dr. Umar's school? <laughs> What's, what? <laughs> he told him. I love that y'all pick on TV though. Like I know that the idea in everybody's head is like schoolyard, like yeah. everybody picks. But this is about as good as it gets. I love that y'all do that. It's hilarious. It would be fire if we picked like right before the game. Though. That would be crazy. <laughs> Why not? There's like, no that, reason not to. Yes, in the locker room. All right, let me get him. <laughs> let me get him on the court. Yo, give me uh thirty. I had the jerseys ready. I have everything ready. <laughs> Yo, they're missing opportunities. They can sell That's both colors. Yeah, you know it'll be mean? so fire, man. You has got two jerseys ready for no matter what. We're throwing all of them in yeah, the market. Let's go. We, we got good. it. It's good. We got two pair of shoes for both. You know what I mean? And y'all just picked the team. Now, I know KD isn't your favorite person, <laughs> but you got to give credit where credit is due, right? I mean, this, you know, I don't, and I don't know. Do we know if the NBA heard this? Recording from uh, from early February 22 and said, "Hey, that's a great idea. It's so obvious. It's such a great idea. Do we know that this was uh, inspired by KD, or is it just coincidence? Either way, he looks good. So, uh, props to KD for coming up with a brilliant idea. Props to the NBA for adopting it. This makes so much sense. You wonder why nobody thought of it or implemented this before now, Natalie." Yeah, I feel like this was sort of the evolution of where this was going because when they did the very, very first draft, it wasn't on air. And like the feedback from like, you know, NBA Twitter and everyone was like, this is so whack. We want to see the draft, you know, all of that kind of stuff. 
And when they found out like most of the players wouldn't care, or at least that's what they were saying, like they didn't care, then like the next one was televised. And so it keeps like evolving each year. So I think this is like the natural evolution because people have been saying, it's been conversations before on Twitter, like, oh, it should be like, you know, like when you at the court and you on the playground. So I think this was the natural evolution. Hurt feelings and chaos, Vinny. Like we need, we need, we need react. We need split screens and and, ca and faces and cameras on everybody's faces yes. for their real time reaction to not getting picked, right, Vinny? The only thing more sensitive than NBA players in a public setting is NFL players when compared to NBA player salaries. <laughs> like I don't know what else y'all could do to embarrass these. Dudes. Remember the first year, Natalie referenced the first draft. Russell Westbrook's name was the last name on LeBron's sheet. And, and it, it turned out to be in alphabetical order, but Russ thought he was the last pick and was mad as hell, right? Can you imagine whoever's going to be the last pick? Remember last year, it was who's going to take the dribbler, James Harden, that, you know, th th that thing from Charles Barkley. And then you had Kevin Durant with this uncomfortable moment and everything else. Yeah, that's going to, Put it like this. The draft will be more watched than the game. I don't even know if that's a good thing. The draft will be more watched than the game. And you remember I, the but, Utah but Jazz what? thing as well? Remember like with Rudy Gobert and those guys when they were like went at the end and LeBron tried to save it and be like, you know, it's just in the past. No one kind of thinks of Utah. Like it's definitely going to like bring up some emotions and drama. <laughs> but, what, but, but what if though, just given that it'll be right before the game, what if the, the hurt feelings the intensity, what if it carries over? Like what if what if it just becomes like because we always wait for the all star traditionally traditionally the all star game picked up at the end when pride took over and that's when it got good. But early on, it's just you know a lot of alleys, a lot of three point shots. We know nobody's playing defense. What if this inspires them in a way that no other incentive ever could? What if dudes oh. really in their feelings and they play like it? This could be awesome, Vinny. Okay, okay, okay. If you're one of the last dudes that's being picked, guess what? You ain't, you ain't getting in the, the game. game. You ain't getting in the game you, early but, enough to make an effect you, on the but, but what if you not pick first? What if you pick second or third? Like, what if it's just some situation where you thought somebody else was gonna pick you and they didn't? I mean, again, they all gonna find reasons to have chips on their shoulder. Like, it's just it's such a a public thing to get to get picked in front of people on the spot. I think there's a, there's a, there's a potential here. Because yeah. we're gonna, we gonna be invested in it at home. I agree. I mean, I think, I, but I think that could go either way, right, Mike? Because it's like you have that player who gets like the chip on his shoulder, so they go out there and like, ru like not ruin the game, but like just try to do the most. Like, I don't think he's gonna be on the All Star, but like we know Russell Westbrook. Like when things are said about him in the media, for example, he's prone to go out there and be a little unpredictable on the court. So you know, he won't be on the All Star team, but. I could make a player go that way or be like, oh, I, I'm going to show y'all. So I think, I think all the drama. So, so Vinny, when you say it's going to be hurt feelings and chaos, like how does that manifest itself? Or do you, do you think this is a bad idea? Do you think this could backfire? You think this is a disaster waiting to happen? Or are you here for it? I think I'm going to reserve my opinion until we're in. Here's the thing. People are going to be mad already because we in Salt Lake City, right? So you're going to have a bunch of honorary <laughs> dudes yeah. pissed off that we're not in our normal all-star enclave of warm weather and groupies, right? We're going to be in Salt Lake City where everything closes at 9 o'clock. And then you got the nerve to have me sitting around and waiting to see what all-star jersey I'm going to be wearing. Like, this is an episode of The Bachelor? Wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. It has potential for chaos and hurt feelings. I don't know if that's going to translate into anybody playing any damn defense. That's the only mm. thing that's going to make the All-Star game actually any better. I think have some of the recent... Been, uh... oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I think some of the recent changes has helped the game get better, like the 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 charities that they play for, because you've seen them get a little yeah. bit more motivated earlier in the game. No, no, um, the end of the that's... game, the end of the game is better. The end of the game is remarkably better with the Elam ending and everything else. You, right. you see that, but... That's for fans who stick around to 11.30 p.m. after watching the first two hours of nothing. Do I sound like an have old man right ever, now? Have you, guys ever been, have you guys ever been the last pick in anything? Y'all know what that, that feel like? Or, you know, when y'all played back in the day, you ever been the last pick? See, I was all-time quarterback, so I never had that problem, you know. <laughs> 
basketball, I was basketball. I was the last pick, typically. You know, I was good for six fouls and a couple of screens. You know, I threw a mean post entry pass. You know, before the growth spurt. <laughs> Before, before the growth spurt, when I was playing with older dudes, and that was always the key, older dudes. Hey, I got a little man. All right, I'll take a little man. That sort of thing. Wait, and then you gotta on, go out there, and, and you gotta go out there and bust you, somebody's ass. You act like you six twelve. What do you mean growth spurt? Like, <laughs> wow. You, like, no, what are you like, I'm that tall. Like, tall no, I'm not. I'm not that the tall at all. Where was that? But, but I, but as a sophomore in high school, I was every bit of 5'2", and in three weeks, I grew to 5'10". So I feel every bit of, I felt every bit of 6'5". I was playing like a small forward <laughs> at the start of my junior year. I'm blocking everybody's take- stuff to the glass and trying to, and touching the rim and all that stuff. I felt yeah, like a GD shaking. giant out there. <laughs> you were dream shaking them? No, but that, that explains it. That explains Vinny in a nutshell. Like I get it. I, I I get the wit. I get the sharp tongue. You know, you you, you developed it early. Um, you're not you're all both of you guys are all stars. Both of you guys are my first picks. So having said that, I delegated and deferred to both of you for the official. This is official. Okay, the the the, the actual all star uh, starters and captains get announced tomorrow on TNT. But this is BFA's official all star starters provided by our resident. NBA experts, Vincent Goodwill, and just Nat for y'all. I know yeah. her last name. Y'all just know her last <laughs> name. Uh, Nat, you go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in the West, um, yeah, of course I have Steph on there. Luca, Yo- Joker, LeBron, and Zion. Uh, and then in the East, Jalen Brown, Donovan Mitchell, Tatum, Giannis, and KD. See, y'all can't say I don't like the man because he's on my ballot. Even though he's hurt right now and there's an argument for Embiid, I still put KD on there. Before we go to yours, Vinny, you wanna you got you wanna nitpick anything from Nets? I'm not gonna pick any nits. I'll just say (laughs) that availability has to come into play when you talk about Zion Williamson, especially considering he's not going to be back for at least another two weeks on top of the time that he's already missed. But from a performance standpoint, I completely agree with you. It's not not a bad ballot at all. Not I, a bad ballot at all. And I agree with Vinny. Like, I went back and forth, but I felt like the other options were like... Because the, the way this is going to factor in is going to also factor in the fan vote. And so, like, Anthony Davis was, like, one of the other people, but he's been unavailable, too. So unless you're going to go to like a Sabonis, someone like that, which I don't think he's going to have enough fan vote to carry him. So that's why I went with Zion. Okay. Vinny, let's see yours. Well, Natalie's going to be not very happy with me, of course, because I, I, factor, be. I factored in <laughs> not just availability, but I factored in if you're the catalyst for arguably the number one team in the Western Conference, and you're that guy, I feel like you deserve representation. That's why I picked Ja Morant. And when you say that no one else really merits consideration for that third forward spot, might the court present Lowry Markinen of the Utah Jazz for like consideration? Like like 25 like and that. 9, most improved player, dunking on everybody. Like, I watched this guy as a rookie, and I was like, man, he could be like Dirk if he figures it out. And then seven years later, he gets the memo. In the East, I can't, I can't really disagree with anything that Nat put out. I did give Kyrie Irving a little consideration, but that was a that was a bridge too far for me to walk at this stage with Jalen Brown playing the ball that he's played. Once again, KD, Giannis, Tatum, pretty easy over Embiid. Philly's going to be mad at us, but Philly's always mad. <laughs> yeah, we have the same ballot well, in met. the East. Y'all did. Great minds. <laughs> Yeah, I know the Steph um, thing is going to be a debate. It's going to be similar to, like, the year when Russell Westbrook won MVP and he didn't start, but, like, Steph is going to be the starter. So, like... like yeah, Steph de- is going to win. He's going to yeah, wind up. He's, like, he's going to wind up starting. People can debate it all they want. His season and the numbers are certainly worthy of it. What really just puts him down is, like, where the Warriors' ranking is and that he missed time. But, like, had that not happened, I don't think it would be a question. So, Ja is certainly worthy, and so is Luka, but... 
it's likely going to be Stefan Luca. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a hard, it, that was the hardest choice on my official, you know, the ballot that I sent to the league and I pretty much was going back and forth on that. So even though Steph wasn't on there, I don't know. I know Steph pays a lot of attention to things that I say and things that I write or things that if I'm Does on a it? podcast, Oh yeah. Everything. Oh, yes. Everything. Steph, Steph you is on, no, no, no. Steph is the most petty yep. and honorary. Yep. Superstar. Giannis is a close second. He acts like he doesn't pay attention. The dudes who say they don't pay attention, they pay attention. They read everything. Why? Because they can't help themselves when they get in front of you to tell you exactly what they thought on some podcast that you were on six months ago when me and our friend Bomani Jones made a comment about Steph being a system player when we called him the system and everybody got all Andre Iguodala got upset Warriors Twitter got upset and they forgot to use their ears and they just used their hurt feelings no Steph heard it too they went back and they had to self-correct themselves don't let him tell you that they came back and walked it back and um but Steph tells you he's petty like he tells you he hears everything he doesn't do the fake act like Giannis but yeah no he everything so so have y'all squashed I, I do remember this now that you mentioned it Vinny because uh, we talked about this on, on the show uh have you uh have y'all y'all cool if anything you've said anything else lately or it was a, a <laughs> one-off like y'all made any other run-ins <laughs> I was going to make a light-skinned joke but that just shows my level of maturity while. me and Steph growing. are on me and me and Steph on excellent terms we we, we yeah. talked it out during the finals we talked a little bit during the, the preseason and then we talked a little bit you know a couple months ago so we are on great yeah. terms until the next time i say something that the petty king don't like Stay, keep the light skin jokes for me okay that's that's just for me and you that's that's just that's our thing all right I'm the only uh, that, 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 nobody else get that, that kind of treatment but me. All right. That and hey. Butterface are the only jokes that me and you will be keeping to ourselves, Michael Smith. Mm -hmm. so don't do it. Don't don't you do it. Uh, before before I go, before we let you go, I was in the car last night, and I almost called you. I was in the, I was driving, and I almost called you, and I wasn't gonna say a word. I was just gonna turn the radio really loud because you know how when a song comes on on the radio. Versus when you play it, it just hit different. Man, I got in the car and I turned it on Sirius XM Silk Channel 330, and all I heard was, "See, first of all, <laughs> I know these so-called players wouldn't tell you this." And I was like, "Oh man, where's Vinny? Where's Vinny right now?" I wanted to call and I wanted to just like <laughs> sing real loud in your ear, but I said, "No, I'm I'm a chill." Because and you know see, what? And, and guess what? And hater. guess what? Hater. And guess what? You just you just said it. What type of dude is the first thing out of his mouth is is to talk about what another dude is or ain't going to do. If I'm trying to propose to my woman, I ain't going to say, hey, man, them dudes over there, they ain't S-H-I-T, but I'm going to be real. <laughs> man, shut up. Sit your ass down somewhere. If you're going to propose, romantic, get man. down on it one knee. Ain't no, ain't no it romance, romance involved. It's, it is it is romance. It'd be a if you played that for Mrs. Smith, it, she should have walked up. <laughs> and left your ass <laughs> right there. Vinny, Vinny, if you ever settle down, if some woman ever gets you to settle down, I have decided amongst myself that I am going to sing Let's Get Married at yeah. your wedding. Whether you whether you want it or not, I'm stealing the you microphone. Sung. I'm going to bust up in there the up for room. I'm going to bust up in there and I'm going to sing Meet Me at the Altar in your white dress. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, Mrs. Goodwill, this is from Vinny, dedicated to you. That's what I'm doing at your wedding. Book it. And, and, and if you sounded like that cat scratching like you was 45 seconds ago, we gonna cut that mic as soon as you grab it. You sound like a cat oh, scratching talking about, yeah, you sounded terrible. Good and I terrible. I sound better when I'm singing with it. I gotta sing what you go, with the song. What, what you gonna say? What you gonna say? Sexual beige? Sexual caramel? Is that what you gonna do? <laughs> so I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Natalie don't get that reference because she's too young. Stop. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I absolutely get the reference. Do not even try to play me. <laughs> Tired of this. <laughs> Dak Prescott, I love him to death. You know, I'm a Dak defender. He is my guy. I think he is a good quarterback. I believe that he has it in him to be a great quarterback, but he hasn't shown that. 
And it can't be just Cowboy fans or Dak fans going to bat for him and saying, he's a great quarterback. He has it in him. He can win a Super Bowl. Dak, you got to meet us halfway. You got to show us why that's true. And he didn't show me why that was true. And I can't, I don't have an excuse for what I saw from him. They were, that was a terrible performance. And there's not an excuse that I can make to defend that. Uh, that was flames coming out of the mouth of uh, Ashley Nicole. It pained me to um, say that, Michael. It of, hurt of, my of heart I to am say athlete. that. Of I am athlete. <laughs> Hello, new job alert, new gig alert, new year, new things. Congratulations. Uh, Thank it's good you. to have you. Thanks, thanks for still blessing the show. And, and Britt Johnson, it's so good to see you as well. Thank you for taking the time. Um, first of all, let me say this to uh, both of you ladies, my two favorite Cowboys fans. Um, this, I am not trolling you guys. I did not. I, I, this, I, I did not bring y'all on a troll. That's not. I don't roll like that. I got too much. Are you sure? Y'all anyway, I'm positive. But I felt. But I felt like I was missing something this week because I was like, I need to hear from them because we, you know, at the beginning of the year, remember, Brett, I wrote them off. You, you tried to set me straight. I didn't listen. Uh, you know, Ashley, you ride or die. And then we kind of checked in as the year was going on. They were doing well. Well, after Sunday, I was like, well, wait a second. Like, I need to hear from Ashley and Brett. So, Brett, I love to start with you because. You and I met this summer at training camp and at the Cowboys yes. media party at Nobu. So kind of a full another full circle moment is this tweet put out by the Cowboys official social media account mm -hmm. that was critical of Dak. I actually found it refreshing as opposed to out of pocket by the by the team owned account. You having previously been employed by the team. I want to know your take on this. Okay, so this tweet wasn't just a tweet all in, in and of itself. It was part of an article. So I think the mm -hmm. key here is don't read just the headline. Click on the article, which that's what I did. I clicked on the article. And I think it was really what Dak was saying about himself. When he went to the podium after the game, he blamed it 100% on himself. He went through both interceptions and kind of talked about it and what that meant and how he messed up and took 100% accountability for it. And what... The good thing about the Dallas Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys were actually the first team to cover themselves. They were the first mm -hmm. team to have their own media group, have a website and start covering themselves. And the Cowboys do it better than anybody else. They spend a lot of money on having a lot of talent that comes in there. And their job is to give their opinion and their job is to be critical of the team whether the team likes it or not. And it does, unfortunately, and unlike other media groups, it does suck because then you have to go to the lunchroom and see the players and the coaches that you just wrote or talked about on a podcast but the cowboys have been known for doing this throughout the year yes this one was a polarizing one because you know everybody's looking to the cowboys twitter page after the loss even though it wasn't not a successful season we did in the season 12 and 5 we did make it to the divisional divisional round so the season was a success considering we had missed our quarterback which we talked about earlier in the year and he won four of those five games with the backup quarterback so i think we did have a successful year and I think it's just one of those things. Don't just click on the headline, read the article. Um, I know Patrick Walker who wrote the article and he is going to say it like it is. And the truth is we had two in our deck had two inter interceptions, did not play the greatest. The week prior played a heck of a game, one of his best games of his career, especially in the postseason. And this week it was unfortunate and he didn't play like he was supposed to play. So it is what it is. Yeah. The Cowboys media isn't going to just lie and just have all these stars right. going around were just great and beautiful and that wasn't the case. No, that's why I thought it was refreshing and actually your old Miami Heat family even got in on the act after last night's game with a little troll job of themselves on their Twitter account. But I mean, actually, we heard from you a second ago on uh, I am athlete tonight. It just sounds like for you as much as you appreciate and respect Dak, this is all fair game at this point. Like it, it's, you know, Dak's kind of brought this on himself uh, with his performance. Yeah, listen, I made no secret. I, I love Dak as a player. I'm lucky to also call him a friend, so it's not ever coming from a place of malice, but you have to call a spade a spade. And we have seen spurts of the greatness that Dak Prescott possesses as an athlete, as a quarterback. So I'm not going to say it doesn't exist. So when people say that, I think that's very far-fetched because if it didn't exist, you would never see it. It wouldn't just come sporadically. You just It would be completely absent from his game. But the the critique of him is not can he do it, is when is he able to do it? And that's 
hasn't been when you need it the most. Yes, Tampa Bay was an impressive game. As Britt said, one of the best of his career, especially in the postseason. But let's go ahead and look at that for what it was. As impressive as that game was for the Dallas Cowboys as a whole team, you're playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who this season have not been very good. This is a shell of what they were when they won the Super Bowl. And yes, Tom Brady, you can never discount him. A goat is a goat is a goat. But even Brady doesn't really look like himself. So while it was impressive, it wasn't overly impressive enough to go into this game thinking that you couldn't or you didn't have to play at that same level or even better with the 49ers. And I think Dak sometimes does not go ahead and do the extra things that some of those elite quarterbacks do. You look at Patrick Mahomes, for example, you'll see Patrick Mahomes go above the X's and O's. He'll go above what the play was that was being called because he knows, listen, I need to make something happen. I need to make it happen now. And that moment in the last three minutes of the game when it was 1912 and the Cowboys had the ball, that was Dak's moment to drive his team down the field and show I'm an elite quarterback just like those guys yeah. and you're going to put some respect on my name. And he can do it. It's just he didn't do it in that game. He didn't do it when it made it when it meant the most and that's the critique yes i get it the interceptions they're on me yes the game is on me but we've heard that before how are you gonna how are you right. going to correct that is what everybody's waiting to see so and we've seen this movie before we've seen it really for the last 30 years as you guys don't need to be reminded so with the two minutes we got left uh before we run 28 out of 28 <laughs> yeah <laughs> Brent, put some respect on it you... 1995 champs damn it <laughs> <laughs> Red, how, how have you processed it and quickly where do the Cowboys go from here to get over that hump? Cowboys need to change the offensive coordinator. That's what I'm going to say. It needs to be a different person in Dak Prescott's ear. We had a lot of issues yep. with our offensive line changing this year. Tony Pollard getting hurt at the, that game was huge and I think we need to get some wide receivers. Jalen Tolbert didn't do it for us. James Washington was out. Michael Gallup didn't play like he was supposed to. We need to get a young receiver in that's going to kill it. The next Jamar Chase, please, somebody. And we need Kellen Moore out. I like Kellen Moore. I think he's great, but I just think someone else needs to be in Dak's ear. And, and, Absolutely. And Ashley, it seems like that's spot on for you. You agree with that? Overhaul of support. Yeah, I mean, I think. That? I think the relation, I mean, Dak was going to suffer when you traded away Amari Cooper. So and you didn't replace mm -hmm. him with somebody else, right? So you need to give him another offensive weapon. Ezekiel Elliott's not the same Ezekiel Elliott he was years ago. Tony Pollard, yes, you have that. But your, your game is going to have to become more pass-reliant than run-reliant like yeah. it has been in the past. And you're going to need more offensive weapons to make that happen. But Kellen Moore and Dak Prescott, that relationship is no longer working out. And they just need to get a divorce at this point. <laughs> All I know is... Uh, that last play was just such a microcosm of, of where the Cowboys are and how far they have to go. They ain't no way in hell they practiced that. <laughs> Speaking of coordination, they, they they didn't practice it against a defense that was resisting. I'm sorry. Right. Like, I, I, I get to get the that smallest guy out of on the head. team too. <laughs> just got knocked out with the quickness. <laughs> but no, well, in I, true I, Cowboys I, I, fashion, Michael, as we all as Cowboy fans are used to saying, we'll get them next year. <laughs> Well, I'll see y'all again soon. It's good to see y'all smiling through it all. Y'all are ride or die. Thanks Appreciate for having us. <laughs> all right. Hey, thank you for watching Brother From Another. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, go ahead and do that now. Don't forget, you can catch us three to four weekdays on PeacockTV.com and on Sirius XM Channel 85.